That shows you what making jokes in the cafe can do to you. We worked on a site called, uh, I'm an archaeologist, I worked on a site called Schlangors, and we found the leg of a short, bandy-legged dog, which we reinterpreted as the first royal corgi, because Schlangors Cranog is, of course, a royal site. We put it on the website, and then it went viral. By the end of the day, I had people emailing me from Kuwait. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I'm not here to talk to you about the jokes that I make. Well, in fact, I, perhaps I am. You will find this later. Thank you so much for the first talk. It was fantastically, a lot of the things that were mentioned will actually, I'm hoping, will relate to what I want to talk to you about now. I'm going to talk to you about the way that we engage with sort of diverse audiences like the TED, TEDx audience. And I'm going to talk to you about the power of merging science with art and imagination to get people to think about their place in the future and where they're going to go. <coughs> I'm going to uh, within the trinity of uh, science, art, and imagination, I'm science. I'm the scientist. I was studied, originally I studied biology, but then I sort of got sucked backwards into the past. And now I spend all of my time looking on living things, once living things, that are now dead. When I say I look at the human past, that is not dinosaurs, just to make that clear. The past 500,000 years, I've never worked with dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were millions and millions of years ago. It's just a question I tend to get asked quite a lot. Now, I'm an academic, so I sit in my ivory tower, but I believe that everybody should have access to my knowledge. I believe that my knowledge about the past is relevant to the present day, and I also believe that everybody should be able to contribute to, the, to a discussion about the future. So what I do is I look at animal remains, and I'm interested in the human-animal relationship all the way through time, from um, animals as they started out as hunted prey, to then farmed animals, and later on they become pampered pets, like the royal corgi we've just spoken about. I began to have conversations with an artist whose name is Paul Evans, and uh, um, Paul is in the audience, and between us, we, we came together because of a mutual interest in animals. In fact, um, you should be able to see the nice picture of the whale. We came together as, because of a mutual interest in whales, the country, rather than whales, the animals. And Paul, in his art, is very interested in animals at all scales and in all ways, hence the life-size picture of the sperm whale we have. And we came together in, to debate and discuss our ideas, and we decided that our common interest in the human-animal relationship we could develop into a project, and we went out and we, seeked, we sought funding, we got money from the Beacon for Wales, and we created this project, which is called Future Animals. Within the art, science, and imagination, who provides the imagination? The imagination was provided by the participants. So we got together groups of people to work with us to think about the future. Now, the actual workshops that we started with were targeted particularly at 14 to 16, 14 to 18 year olds, to get them to think about their place in the future. But within that, we brought together um, university lecturers, museum staff, postgraduates, and everybody came together to discuss you know, where we were going and what we were going to do. Now, the role of art may still seem strange to you, but if you think about the way that humans have always thought about animals, Animals, the earliest representations that we have in cave art are animals. We've always been used our imagination to think about animals, going into caves to draw them, to start with. And then we've changed animals in many ways. We've created these sort of mythical creatures, things like flying horses and dragons. And today we still use our imagination. I don't know if anybody, I don't know if it's just because I was giving this talk, but every day this week the radio seemed to be discussing some strange new combination of genes that were being used to make another animal. You can think about things like the spider goats. These are goats who've been genetically manipulated to produce spider silk in their milk. I'm not entirely sure why, but <laughs> we do now have spider goats, you'll all be glad to know. We also have cats that glow, and the cats glow in order to indicate gene transference. And so we now have synthetic biology as well. Synthetic biology is a new emerging part of uh, biology which allows you to manipulate the genes within organisms to create completely new animals. So we now have bacteria that can produce biofuels, um, store data, um, identify poisons. <clears throat> so we continue to use our imagination, I would say, and that it's always been very important in the way we think and in where we're going with this. However, who makes the decisions about these future animals? 
you think about it, most of the decisions, I mean, yes, the spider goat, for example, I'd never heard of the spider goat before it appeared on television. I think it was on Horizon, actually. So who makes the decisions? And it's mostly committees. It's behind closed doors or people in laboratories. And it's not open and available to the public gaze. We actually were aiming to try and give this um, decision-making process back to people, to engage people in a new understanding of how, how things change and what sort of um, decisions need to be made. OK. So what sort of imaginary animals would you like in your future? Would you like a racing tortoise? <clears throat> we asked the teenagers, and this was one of the examples we produced for them. So tortoise, how much use is a racing tortoise going to be in the future? I suggest that it might be useful in the new world of uh, reptil reptilian racing, or it could just be a topic of conversation. But if you think about how would you change a tortoise for it to become you know, to enter the world of uh, faster tortoises, you could give it a lighter shell, longer legs, increased lung capacity. You know, it could run along quite well. And in fact, it's changed now into something that looks a little bit more like a greyhound. But the point is, you know, this may seem ridiculous, but greyhounds did not always look the way that greyhounds are today. I'm going to ask you all a question. Do you sleep with the enemy? Wolves were our, our enemies and have been over many millennia because of their instincts to hunt and to kill. But we live with those animals in our homes. We trust them with our vulnerable children. We have changed a whole range of animals over time, and we now live in very, very close proximity with a series of animals that were previously wild. This diagram can demonstrate to you sort of some of the many species that we've changed through the process of domestication. I think it starts with the dog and ends up with the catfish. <laughs> the point is that we, don't, we haven't just tamed animals in the past. We haven't just taken animals and made them you know, easier to live with because we've tamed them and calmed them and sort of made, acclimatized them to us. We've genetically changed them. We've domesticated them in a process of accelerated, directed evolution. <coughs> we've changed them not only so that they're easier to keep and therefore easier to eat, eat. We change them because we now use them as beasts of burden. We, they become our loyal companions. We keep them for aesthetic purposes, for our entertainment. There's now a whole new series of relationships that we have with animals. So we've, uh, we gave the teenagers some of these examples of the way we changed animals in the past and asked them to create their futures. Now, why did we ask them to draw the future? Why didn't we just ask them to tell us about the future or debate it with us or discuss it? Well, the point is that art is a fantastic medium for sort of non-verbal communication. A lot of the teenagers we were working with were outside formal learning groups. But by allowing them to draw, people could create images and not coherent arguments. It's also, a, teenagers regard uh, drawing as a kind of a group activity. It's something you do together. You can draw an image, and then your neighbor chats to you about it. You share ideas. You swap your pens and your rulers and your rubbers. And so it's a, it's a fantastic group experience. Everybody gets to join in, and you can reveal your sort of imaginings. The most interesting thing about working with diverse groups, because everybody who took part in these workshops had to do a drawing from professors right the way down, was quite how insecure the people with the most knowledge and power were about drawing their own images. You know, I've never seen a professor of biosciences crumble quite so much as when asked to draw a picture. And for the people involved in the workshop, that was fantastic. Because you can see somebody you think has knowledge and power, and it turns out that they too are very, very um, insecure about their ability to create an image. So what did they create? I think if you want to go and look, there's some images that are outside, um, up where you'll be having coffee. We've put up some of the images from the initial workshops and some of the later workshops that we did. But they came up with a fantastic series of animals. They were sort of sport-provoking, bizarre, amusing, entertaining. So we had, I think, if we can see from the top, we had a, a Dali-esque sheep who grew so much wool they had masses to spare. You didn't clip them, it sort of draped off of them. We had um, armoured turtles. We had helicopter cows. We had a living alligator handbag. And my favourite, my absolute favourite, is the feather boa constrictor. 
fashion item and personal security device. <laughs> we also then, well, sorry, we then took the art from the initial exhibition, framed it, and put it in the National Museum. And again, that was a great opportunity for the teenagers to enter into a space which you know, many of them very rarely visited. And also, it was quite often seen as a formal and exclusive space that you're not allowed to go into, and you certainly wouldn't be showing your art in it. The exhibition proved to be incredibly popular. It was only up for a very short time, but over that period, they, um, 1,500 people came and produced images, which is the small cards you can see on this side. They, they only know that because they ran out of cards at 1,500. So at least 1,500 people went along and really enjoyed and engaged with the um, exhibition. <coughs> However, what is the point of all of this, really? And what does it mean that if we change animals? I'm sure many of you know that pedigree dogs suffer from a whole range of problems. And we talked to the teenagers about both the animals they imagined in the future and also what has happened to dogs today. You must, some of you probably also know that the BBC have refused to screen crufts for the past two years because of the problems with kennel club standards, which are continuing to allow dogs to be bred in particular ways that make them unhealthy. So we use these stories to talk to people about the changes we've, that have been wrought on animals. And in fact, the archaeological record is, of course, a fantastic place to look for this sort of evidence. And in particular, we use the skulls of dogs to talk to teenagers about this. So again, if you come later, if you want to see upstairs, we have a range of dog skulls. Some of them are casts, some of them are real, I have to say. None of them were killed for the purposes of our research. <laughs> um, but if you look up here, I've got an image of a wolf and a uh, Pekingese. Now, you should be able to see, <laughs> first of all, one of them is much bigger than the other, OK? You can guess that the wolf is the lower one. But the other thing you should be able to pick up is that there's been a number of changes between these animals. One of the ones that um, is sort of most sort of, so it's least obvious possibly is, can you see there's a, there's a crest on the back of the dog's, of the wolf's skull? That's where the muscles attach for biting. There's no such crest on the Pekingese. So Pekingese is not going to give you a very good bite. But if you look at the Pekingese, you'll also realize that his foreshortened nose means that he has a terrible um, underbite. So the teeth underneath stick out quite a lot, which again is, is problematic, shall we say. The other thing is the eye sockets on this dog are also much more poorly formed than they are on the wolf. So these, these, we've changed this animal from sort of the supreme sort of, um, sort of hunting machine. I always think of Little Red Riding Hood, you know, my what big ears you have, Grandma, all the better to hear you with, what big eyes, all the better to see you with, what big teeth, all the better to eat you with. And if you look at a Pekingese, I don't know what Little Red Riding Hood would say about that. <laughs> However, um, the Pekingese has a terrible series of health problems. The Pekingese overheat because they can't breathe very well. They have problems with breathing. They, they have problems with their eyes because their eye sockets aren't fully formed, and they have problems giving birth. So through the discussion, through showing people these materials and having a discussion, it allows us to bring sort of the, the, these imag imagined animals into a debate. And we ask people to comment. We ask the teenagers to comment on what they thought about the animals they'd imagined and the changes we'd done to both domestic dogs and to domestic cattle, uh, domestic cattle, sheep, and other species. We had an ethics debate. See, it's always one of those fantastic things. You always think you're going to go out and talk to teenagers and they're going to get, you know, get, get with it, and you're going to have a fantastic kind of snappy debate. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And in this case, it went kind of went a bit viable, really. The teenagers became completely fully engaged <laughs> because we allowed them, I think, to ask questions that they would normally wouldn't ask. So one of the first questions we were asked by one group was, is it true that people, women can give birth to puppies? I had to say this wasn't true. I said, you know, most things we can debate, but we're not debating that because that's just not true. But it was interesting because no, up until that point, nobody ever, ever sort of told them or they'd never been able to ask somebody that question. They didn't understand, possibly, you know, the biology behind it. So once we got past whether people could give birth to puppies, we then moved on to debates about whether it be appropriate to breed animals for food, how much we should change them. Um, you know, it's all right for show dogs. What about inherited diseases? What about inherited diseases in people? 
with the, the debate eventually ended up focusing around international food security, with a number of the teenagers informing us that they'd rather go to war than garden. <laughs> they'd rather fight than dig for Britain. And I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But the best thing was that through this sort of creative process and a conversation with them about their drawings and about the material, was they felt empowered to enter into this debate. I don't believe that any of them prior to this were ever asked to be part of a debate or even probably felt fully engaged enough to have an opinion about, is it right to change animals for our future? But I mean, I think that's incredibly important because we all have to make these decisions because our future is changing and a lot of what we're changing is the animals around us as well as sort of the broader environment. Because our participation techniques have been so successful, we've kind of taken them out. And I've now created a thing that's called guerrilla archaeology. We are the underground resistance movement of archaeology. What we do is we try and combine different, different sort of facets of the world to understand what's going on and how we feel about our place in it. So we've been combining sort of art, science, imagination, music and performance, and taking these ideas out to different diverse audiences. We've taken future animals out to different age groups and we took it out to the Green Man Music Festival last year as um, Back to the Future. You should be able to spot Richard Madgewick, my postgrad, um, channeling Doc Brown there. Um, <coughs> it, I mean, all of this is, I think you said, you, you know, we, we, should, we should bring the fun back and the party back into it. And part of this is that you, we, you know, we can go out and have fun with these ideas. We can go to festivals and talk to people in an engaging, entertaining way about what is actually a very, very serious issue. I mean, a part of my research is on the relationship between um, humans and red deer in prehistory. So this year, coming to a festival near you, my research will be delivered by the shamanic street preachers. <laughs> Because I've been working on a set of fantastic headdresses that date to 10,000 years ago that are found in Britain, and they think they were worn by shamans. We've decided to recreate these headdresses using seven deer skulls that I've identified. We will be dressing as shaman. We will be inviting people to come and think about their relationship with the world by thinking about possibly transforming into animals or the way you know, the balance is through, between man and nature, culture and society. And is this, you know, this, people say, oh, really, Jackie, you're just doing that to go to festivals, aren't you? <laughs> well, partly, yes. <laughs> but what's emerged from this is that we've realised that just by thinking about producing some fantastic shamanic fashion, that we have, we've realised that people don't actually understand these artefacts at all. And we can now kind of strap a large research project to come up with good quality academic data, as well as something that engages people and gets them to think about where, who they are and the way they live. So finally, I have hope that I've persuaded you that if you combine art, science and imagination, as well as obviously a little bit of fun, you can get people to think much more about and to engage much more with what seems like quite complex ideas that possibly they wouldn't engage with normally and they may not think about in a particularly sophisticated way. But we've allowed them, particularly through the use of art, to access this information and also to access us because quite often it's the process it's the dialogue between us and our potential audiences that's valuable both for the people who ask us the questions but also those people who are attempting to answer them anyway thank you <laughs>